Welcome to FUH Cast, a podcast from Fakih University Hospital. After your overwhelming feedbacks about our last episode, we decided to continue our podcast pediatric series for back to school season. I'm Dr. Sarah Risk, pediatric specialist at Fakih University Hospital, and I'm thrilled to welcome today Dr. Amin Dahir, pediatric pulmonologist and sleep medicine consultant, to discuss everything and all your doubts about sleep problems and sleep concerns during our back to school season. Welcome, Dr. Amin, today, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. Amin, I was, um, I was really um, asked actually by our uh, audience to speak a little bit about all the sleeping uh, problems and uh, the sleep concerns that parents come to our clinic asking for, uh, for help because you know like how important is sleep during um, back to school uh, season, how important it is to go back to, to our routine uh, after spending a lot of uh, time um, in summer, in different uh, places, you know, the routine is uh, affected. So now uh, I would like to hear from you about your experience um, seeing this kind of patients. How, uh, how would you uh, manage or how important it is uh, to have good sleeping hours in our back to school uh, and uh, our back to school season and how does it impact our children? Uh, very good, very interesting. So a common problem that parents find or kids is readjusting to a different schedule. Oftentimes, the schedule during the summer is sort of, you know, improvised. And uh, fitting back into the regular routine is one of the challenges they face. Another challenge that they may face is getting enough hours of sleep into the night and also figuring out how much hours of sleep you need. With regards to fixing the sleep schedule, there's several ways to look at it. You know, um, roughly, if you want to adjust the sleep schedule, you can move it back about one hour a day. So if our kids are sleeping at 10 and they should be sleeping at 8, then we would back, you know, the two or three days prior to school starting, we should start getting into that rhythm. Um, one of the things that we need to pay attention to, uh, or the major advice that I give people is finding a few anchors in the day, basically things that don't change. So to give you a concrete example, if school starts at 7.30 and we have to wake up at 6.45, that will never change. That anchor is steady throughout the whole week. So that's one of the anchors that we may want to use leading the few days or the week leading up to the school year. Basically wake them up at the same time as they would before uh, when school starts. The falling to sleep, it's much harder to tell somebody to sleep two, three hours before they're ready to sleep Mm -hmm. than it is to try to wake them up when they should. So the falling to sleep on time will sort of happen by itself slowly if we start waking up at the same time it will become gradually slowly slowly we start gradually until we reach the sleeping time we aim for uh well really what we want is we want to wake up time that we need and we need to be sleeping enough before and that will sort of self-determine as long as we give children um, the tools and we put the the proper environment so also just like we have to wake up earlier we really shouldn't be in summer mode in the middle of the night before we go to sleep. Yeah, definitely. Bas- basically, the sleep routine needs to set in also as well. I mean, they can do whatever they want during the day, but the morning time should be closer to school wake-up time, and the uh, sleep routine before they fall asleep should start to you know, become concrete again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amin, for this uh, helpful um, uh, answer. Um, as you know, we have a special or specific recommendation, at, I would say, or guidelines uh, for sleeping hours or the need of sleeping hours according to the age uh, group. So as you know, in pediatric, we have different age groups. Can you mention like the main uh, age groups and how much hours of sleep they need to be fully functional the other day? Especially, I think this is important for parents to know. So according to their kids, they can just have an idea. Because they come and they tell me, for example, my son is 15 years and he's sleeping eight uh, hours only. So for them, eight hours is very little, uh, but maybe maybe it's normal. So I would really um, I would really uh, like if you can explain this to our uh, audience. So the um, age appropriate sleep requirements uh, are uh, they are arranged. Usually it's 
plus or minus one or two hours for each age group. Um, roughly speaking, teenagers, eight, eight and a half hours is good. That means that some of them, seven and a half is good enough. Some of them actually need... It's like an average. Um, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, a, it's most kids and then plus or minus one or two hours. Some, some people actually need a little bit less or a little bit more than the average. But uh, for teenagers, it would be eight, eight and a half hours. For a 10-year-old, it would be closer to nine hours. For a five-year-old, it could be around um, 11 hours or so. One of the challenges that I find a lot with parents who have several kids is understanding that different kids of different ages yeah. would have different sleep requirements. And since everybody needs to wake up at the same time for school, that sort of can be challenging. I don't know if you've noticed this. Yes, you're right, uh, Dr. Amin, because uh, when, when you have like maybe three kids of different ages and then uh, each child will see the other, um, the other child sleeping earlier or uh, later, it's, it's hard for the parents to explain that. But definitely each age group needs uh, specific uh, timings uh, or, or sleep hours for them to be functional the other day. Uh, now, I would, um, I would like to, to discuss something that we see uh, a lot in our clinic. It's uh, sleeping problems at night, like snoring, like mouth uh, breathing, um, like sometimes, uh, you know, sleep apnea or any, uh, any other sleep disorders. Um, when I ask uh, parents, some of them come, for example, with a lot of uh, mouth breathing and maybe related to other medical conditions, and that's really affecting their sleep at night and their quality of sleep, I would say. Uh, they are sleeping, but not in very good quality. What would you um, say about sleep quality and what are the main uh, medical conditions that are, might affect that? Very good, very good question. So uh, really just to, to, I mean, we're going basically through everything that's important about sleep. So when I have somebody in my clinic, I talk about sleep timing, sleep quantity, and sleep quality. And I'm very happy that you're sort of addressing them like that. So sleep quality basically is once we are asleep, are we resting well? The most common sleep disturbance uh, or problems leading to sleep disturbance would be obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea in kids is, is very different than what we usually see in adults. Uh, it's different in its causes, it's different in its manifestation, it's different in what people would see and in the complications that come afterward. The way I would like to explain obstructive sleep apnea to parents in my clinic is it's a breathing problem that leads to sleep disturbance. Mm -hmm. So if the snoring wakes the brain up, disrupts the sleep, takes the child from deep uh, stages of sleep into lighter stages of sleep, even if they don't fully awake or arouse. And if that happens frequently, that would lead to unrestful sleep. Mm -hmm. Also, something that's very interesting as a difference between pediatric and adult sleep apnea is kids with obstructive sleep apnea commonly have uh, hyperactivity as a symptom as opposed to excessive sleepiness. Adults, they tend to be sleepy if they don't breathe well or sleep well. Kids, they tend to be uh, hyperactive. Hyperaroused. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hyperaroused. Uh, irritable, have problems sitting down, focusing, dealing with changes. That's often a distinction that you know, parents don't notice. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Amin. So um, I would also like to uh, mention something, and it's very frequent uh, Nowadays, especially in the adolescent age, it's, it's the screen time and the use of the iPad and, you know, like the light stimulation before sleeping. I hear a lot of concerns about that, that they are staying on the iPad for one, two hours. And then, you know, like the lighting, the stimulations, all that will affect the brain. And then they cannot reach a good uh, sleep uh, quality and quantity, as you uh, already mentioned. I would say, how does the screen time affect uh, sleeping uh, quality? It's a very important uh, topic. So... Um, th there's a lot of recent discussions as to how and what the role of screens and screen time is in poor quality and quantity of sleep. But generally speaking, you can look at it in several ways. It, it fills a lot of time that we should be sleeping, so it's a wasted opportunity for sleeping, especially if we're doing that in bed. It also um, takes away the concept and the structure of a sleep routine, be it a five, 10 minutes routine or a 45 minutes routine if we're just watching you know, something on electronics that goes away. And then it also affects the internal sleep clock as far as how light stimulation affects the brain and, and our internal clock. 
Yeah, so definitely we recommend the, the parents to stop maybe using the iPad, I would say, uh, at least two hours before going, uh, going to bed. What do you think? So, so uh, screens two hours before sleep should be stopped if possible yeah uh, i add to it a few things i also try to put a, a blue light filter as much as i can make the screens as yellow which is a little bit different than brightness so there's brightness and there's the uh, colors of the screen so i try to bring both down if possible and we also have to understand that there's a lot of homework that happens on the computer um and 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 my approach to that is at least don't do it in bed So tell me, what has your experience been so far as far as who comes with sleep questions? Have you been getting some teenagers or is it more their parents that are concerned? And uh, really, you know, what are people looking for or wondering about? It depends in children and adolescents. Um, mainly the concerns are from parents because the kids want to, to sleep less and stay more awake because they have more activities to do. And each time they're asking for more time to stay awake. So mainly the concerns come from, from parents. And uh, that's interesting because when I ask about uh, the concentration, the mood, it's really all affected in, in these kids. So lack of sleep uh, or sleep deprivation will affect, the, the as I said, the mood, the, the, the mental status. And some kids will cause some anxiety, some palpitations when you go back to the history and uh, uh, and uh, you dig into details, you will know that they didn't have uh, a good amount of sleep. I receive a lot of adolescents that are sleeping around 3 and 4 a.m. And then they wake up at 5 or 6 to get uh, ready for school. They spend the whole day not able to, uh, to learn well. They're not able to have a good communication with their peers. They are very sleepy in class and they are not productive. And I also always discuss this with, with, uh, with the parents. I recommend them the, the recommended, uh, actually, sleeping hours uh, per age. And I also give them some few tips for them to improve that, uh, especially in back-to-school uh, season. So at least, even if it's gradually, we will reach a time where we will have a good sleeping hours, good performance, and good productivity for the kids. Sleep often is something that we tend to sacrifice, especially in modern society, in order to maximize the things that we do during the day. And that's a problem kids, adults have, whether it's externally imposed because of everything that we have to do, or it's something internally that, that, that we do ourselves. In your experience, it's a two-part question. Do you feel like most of the screening for those sleep questions are physician-driven, or do the parents come with this? And the second part is of the question is, um, how much public awareness of all the sleep requirements as far as time, quality, and timing sh should we increase in order to have more patients and parents come to us with those problems? Yeah, it's really important to, uh, to have a better education for parents about the sleep uh, disturbances and sleep uh, problems and how it affects and impacts our uh, children's health. So as a, a general pediatrician, I feel like uh, my role is very crucial in, uh, in alerting or educating the parents about this important uh, topic. Uh, I should uh, try to explain them what are the recommendations, what are uh, easy tricks uh, to, 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 uh, to improve their sleep according to their age. So definitely for us, um, it's very um, crucial to keep... Uh, uh, giving awareness and talk more about sleep and especially how it affects uh, the kids' daily uh, health and clinical uh, problems. Uh, I would like also to add how important is um, uh, sleeping hours for our kids' immunity because we see a lot of kids with uh, a lot of recurrent infections and I would also uh, like to highlight the importance of good sleeping hours in building our kids' immunity and preventing uh, different kind of uh, infections, especially in this um, time where the transmission will be really higher. Uh, the, way, the way I'd like to explain it is we spend about a third of our time sleeping, and that's just because it is that important. Whether it's for um, consolidating all that you've learned during the day, whether it's for your organs to sort of reset and calm down uh, or rest, or whether it's for you to be ready to tackle the next day and do the most out of it. Um, and that includes all the functions of, 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 the, of the system, basically. Doctor, I mean, having a sleep uh, medicine clinic here in uh, Fakih, especially for uh, kids, is really, 
is really important and I'm not sure if, um, if uh, people are aware of this. So um, can you just tell us how you address uh, this clinic and what are the main things you do there? Absolutely, absolutely. So really it's any and all sleep concerns. So it goes from uh, answering the parent's concern or the patient's concern themselves um, to helping parents figure out what is normal and what is not normal to navigating what to expect as a child grows and their sleep needs, to figure out what kind of testing should be done when and how and where, and then also what interventions are available. Um, and then what other specialists may or may not need to be involved in. Basically, we take the concern and we get to a uh, better understanding of what's happening, what's a um, diagnostic plan that may or may not include sleep studies, and then what is the treatment and management plan and follow-up? Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Amin, for being with us uh, today. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually very happy with this podcast initiative, and I think it's very, very good for the community. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the audience for hearing us. And uh, we promise to keep uh, giving you the best updated uh, medical uh, information in a very easy and understandable way with all our our knowledgeable uh, colleagues. See you later. Keep your questions for us and see you later in FUH cast. Thank you.